So uh, I'm going to start out by talking about the November 2nd ballot in Braintree, who's going to be on it. Uh, and then Rich Bilecki, who has been a camp ma campaign manager for three candidates, will speak about uh, campaign management. We have representatives from town council, school committee, and the electric life board to talk about their roles and how they ran for office. And I'll do a, a, a short um, um, synopsis of what ho housing authority does. So the ballot um, in, on November 2nd will uh, have all of the town, all of the town councils on it. Their term is two years. So they're all up for re-election in 2021. Um, it's important to note that um, we have seen how very, very important these local offices are this year. Uh, they have, have had to make some really tough decisions. Um, and uh, those decisions have impact our daily lives. In 2017, in the local election in Braintree, there were only two contested uh, town council seats. Um, District two had uh, the town councilor retired and there were three people running for that. And district six, um, the town councilor retired and um, it ended up being a write-in campaign. So, when I went to vote in 2017 in District 4, the only uh, local official, that, the only local contest that I had that was contested was library trustee. I had to pick four out of the five candidates. So uh, this was more in 2019 because of the mayoral race all of these seats were contested except for district, again, district four, Stephen O'Brien. School committee, uh, we see that, um, that Cyril Chase, George Kokoros and Jen Dolan are, are um, up for reelection this year. We don't know whether they're going to run or not. Um, they have not announced. Uh, the candidate, the school committee members who are, uh, who are in white, I have a four year term and they won't be up for re-election till 2023. Library Board of Trustees, um, the four candidates listed shaded here are gonna be on the ballot. Um, Electric Light Board, um, two candidates are on the ballot. Uh, those are all four year terms. Housing Authority, uh, the two candidates that are shaded, John Kerrigan and Albion Fletcher, are up for re-election. Um, there's one state-appointed member that is uh, Sandra Sisk. She, her term ends in June. So with that, I would like to introduce Rich Balecki, and um, he's going to talk about about the candidate process. Rich, you all set to go? Yep. Thank you, Kathy, and uh, thank you to the committee for uh, inviting me to speak. Um, quick background, as Kathy said, I've run uh, three campaigns in the last, well, 10 years, Senate campaign, a mayor campaign, and um, a register of probate campaign. But I've been also involved in campaigns for longer than I want to remember, actually. So uh, I think we figured it was about 40 something years. I started in Dorchester in sixth grade, so it's been a long time, and I've, I've done a lot of different positions in them uh, in each campaign, uh, running election days, running the actual campaign, running phone banks and things like that. What I would say is that what Kathy just showed us is what positions are up for uh, re-election. We won't know um, until, you know, papers are pulled whether the people that are in those um, positions are running, so... I don't want people to think because somebody's in there and it's already in there that they shouldn't run. So the beginning of this slide is kind of a no brainer, I guess, if you're thinking about running, 
is think about what position you want to run for. Uh, we've seen what the positions are up. Uh, there's library, there's different positions in town. And it's uh, what I would say is, you know, it's what your interest is, what your expertise is, and with counselor, it's whether you want to go, you know, district or town-wide. All the other um, roles are town-wide. So you would be running town-wide unless you're running for a district um, position in, in the town council. The biggest thing I want to emphasize uh, as somebody coming from the campaign manager side, so somebody running the, the campaign, not the candidate, and I'm, I'm going to be very interested to see how the candidates think about some of the things I've said, actually, um, is that you got to realize what a commitment this is. Uh, there's a big commitment through, you know, to yourself, your personal time, uh, how it affects your job or how your job affects how much time you're going to have to run and your family commitment, of course. Um, what, what it will take away from your family or whether your family, you know, time that you have with your family allows you to run. And uh, nothing I'm saying, I don't want anybody to think I'm trying to tell people they shouldn't run. I'm just making sure that people have realistic uh, expectations of it. Um, when we look at the dates on the next slide, the dates are in July for nomination papers. But what I want to emphasize is if you're thinking of running, if you're going to run, or if you're just thinking about running, or think about helping someone, or convincing someone to run, um, I should have probably made the ASAP here uh, bigger. It's never too early to start. I'm going to emphasize that a few times in the next five minutes, but it's never too early to start. Uh, I've had a couple campaigns where we started very early. I've had some campaigns where we did a uh, six, you know, six or seven or eight week sprint. An eight week sprint is not fun. Um, so I think if you're thinking about running, what you want to do is make some calls, look at your circle of influence, the people that are your, 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 your best friends, the people you, you have a professional relationships with, people in town that you, you trust and you um, feel that you, you can use as sounding boards, find out if they think you know, you're, you're a legitimate candidate, find out if you think you're a legitimate candidate. candidate. Um, I'm gonna say something that a lot of times we don't say is the state has a great department uh, to help you out. Um, I have found the OCPF, which is the, um, the Office of Campaign and Political Finance to be very helpful and to be, have an excellent website. They have a, um, a, a piece up there that's called Getting Started. It talks about organizing your committee. It goes through what you are expected to do for each level of um, whether you're running for mayor, state office, town office. It does a great job of explaining that. Um, if I was telling someone what they should do first after making some calls to some people that they might want to get involved in their campaign is to go up to OCPF and look at some of that stuff. Uh, they also have training, and then Kathy's going to, there's some training next week for town offices. Um, when you're setting up your committee, you have to look at uh, treasurer and a committee chair. Uh, neither one of those really should be you. They should be somebody that, um, that is uh, going to help you on your campaign. The treasurer is a very important position in that they're going to be, um, you know, the person that has to file your finance, should be filing your finance report. And I would emphasize that you want to keep that the money side of that separate from yourself as a candidate. Um, I wrote down, I put down campaign manager, volunteer, chair, you know, somebody that might be doing signs and data. And what I mean by data is, um, you know, whether you're looking at who has voted, the voter record, and um, also data about um, volunteers and what people have have, uh, have volunteered with other campaigns and things. Um, you want to go to the next slide. And I would emphasize that um, you, know, you may sit there and say, well, I'm a candidate. I'm running for District 2. I don't need a campaign manager. I can be the campaign manager. Um, that is true. Um, I, a couple of slides from now, I'll give you my opinion on whether that's a good thing to do or not. Um, these are the requirements, uh, signature requirements for each, uh, not less than 150. The only thing I would say about this really is you want to get 20 to 25 percent over what they've asked you to do. They're going to certify these signatures and you don't want to be the person to pass in the signatures uh, and you needed 100 and you only got 110 and you know 20 of them get certified and then you're not on the ballot. 
Uh, you want to go to the next one? Um, this is the, the dates. Again, July 26th is the first day to obtain nomination papers. It's now February 10th, I believe, if my COVID calendar in my head is working. Um, it seems like it's a long way off, but again, it's never too soon to, to stop moving forward. Uh, you want to be able to hit the ground running on July 26th to get your nomination, your signatures. And, um, you know, I'm going to bring up COVID a couple of times, but COVID, you know, has affected the way you can go out and get this. So it's it's not always as easy as it was um, way back. The other dates you can look through, uh, it's the last days in September uh, to, separate, to get nomination papers. Uh, if you do that, you get four days to get all the signatures. Um, there's dates for the uh, filing of the town clerk and posting a list of the candidates. And um, then there's a drawing for the position of the ballot that is, uh, you know, yeah. It's not always alphabetical. So if you want to go to the next one, this is what the treasurer would be looking at. Um, you know, when you have to put in your treasury reports onto the OCPF. And OCPF has a very uh, excellent um, online method of putting in your, uh, your reports. So if you're treasurer, you want to get your treasurer to do some uh, training on some of that stuff. And the next slide. So this is my, you know, go for it. If you want to go for it, uh, what I would say is, you know, it, again, as ASAP, put together a plan. You have to think about fundraising. You have to think about what people are going to be helping you, uh, what people are going to be, you know, I'd expand that committee out to who's going to be your, you know, advisors, uh, a weekly meeting maybe, or a bi-weekly meeting, depending on how, how much you want to be on top of all that stuff. Uh, data again, I think is going to be very important. Uh, it always is, but with COVID, it's almost more important because we're not sure. It was an interesting, I, I just ran a campaign during COVID. It was interesting because, you know, door knocking and getting in front of people is what you want to do. And COVID has uh, moved that into the background where you can't really, I mean, you could go out and knock doors, but not a lot of people are going to answer. Uh, the percentage that people answer is, is, isn't is great, even in good times. So it's, you have to know how to utilize your time. And that's where data with, uh, you know, voter records and things like that uh, come in, uh, just to be able to utilize your time in a better way. COVID, COVID, COVID. So I have data and time. Again, I bring up time. But COVID, COVID, COVID uh, is going to affect you. I think everybody now is probably somewhat uh, comfortable with what we're doing right now with a Zoom meeting, but you're probably going to have to get more comfortable being the person doing the talking and running the meeting or having someone run it with you. Uh, you're going to have to look at calls versus knocking on doors. So uh, phone banking and things like that and fundraising, you know, fundraising might be interesting under COVID uh, still, uh, unless they, you know, expand some of the phases and things. So again, I'm not trying to, I'm just looking at a perspective of managing the campaign and noting, knowing what, having realistic expectations of time, how you're going to get money, how you're going to get people involved. Um, but I also would emphasize, um, if you can get someone that is uh, close to you, uh, again, that you have complete trust in uh, or have decided you want to run your campaign, I, 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 I'd be, again, interested in what Tom, Julia, and others think, um, because I have told people, be the candidate. You really just want to be the candidate. Uh, you don't want to run the meetings. You may, may want to do that. You may want to keep control of it, but it's always good to have someone next to you that can do, take that away from you. Uh, take away running the volunteers, taking away running meetings, taking away um, look, you know, setting up fundraising, things like that. You want to be able to make the decisions and things, but you also want to be the person that's out there running. And I, I think it's very important that you, you make sure you be the candidate. Also enjoy the experience. Uh, I thoroughly enjoy politics. I have never taken that step to be out front. I was kind of I've liked being the guy next to the candidate. Um, I know you're putting yourself out there, but enjoy it. Um, you know, it's an experience that you, uh, not everybody has. And, and, um, and, um, and uh, 
I want, I don't think you should get into it and, um, you know, and not have, have fun with it, honestly. And what I mean by stay active is, uh, is on actually more if you've gone through all this and you've decided not to be a candidate, I would stay active. And maybe you're the person that becomes a campaign manager for someone, or you become the treasurer, or you um, are just that person that is at every thing for some candidate and you find a candidate you want to uh, make sure it gets into office um, and stay active you know, with this committees like this and other things. And uh, maybe it's the next time that you run. Um, so uh, I guess I'd throw this up to, uh, I just wanted to throw out a few things and not spend a lot of time so that the candidates could get on and tell you uh, what their experiences are. But I wanted people to think about that, you know, again, it is a commitment. And um, if you don't have the time and that commitment, uh, you might want to you know, rethink it or uh, make, just make sure you have realistic expectations. And I, I, I feel like myself right now that I'm being a little down there, but I'm not trying to be that. I'm just trying to make sure that people know. I, I think um, my final comment would be, uh, my opinion has always been the more candidates we have, the better the government becomes because you have opinions, even to the people that don't win, bring up opinions and comments and ideas that may uh, make that government better. So I uh, will we'll always encourage people to get involved and to uh, run. So if you have any questions or anything, either now or after everybody else speaks, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you. Rob, do you have a question? Your hand is raised. Yeah, I was wondering, are we doing questions now or, or at the end? So uh, I have one for Rich. Stop. Whatever yep. anybody wants. Uh, we well, do them at the end. Um, let's, let's, uh, let's go through the candidates first, just so we have to, so we keep on target time-wise. Uh, I, and then uh, we'll open up questions at the end. Does that sound all right? Okay, so, with me. Yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sure. that, that was great. Uh, so our next, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen in a minute, but uh, we have two, we're fortunate to have two Braintree Town Councilors, uh, Julia Flaherty. Uh, she is from District 1. You see it over here in the western part of Braintree. And Meredith Berica, who it is District 5 Town Councilor, right? Uh, smack dab in the middle of town. So um, uh, go ahead, Julia or uh, Meredith, if you'd like to begin. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Kathy. Um, we're going to divide and conquer here. And um, if I haven't met you before, my name is Meredith Berica, and I'm the town counselor from District 5. And just to echo a few sentiments of Rich, what Rich was talking about, you know, I think I know I'm passionate about local government. That's why I ran for town council in the first place, because it really does matter. It impacts, you know, really intimately people's day to day lives, whether it's trash pickup, stoplights, parks, um, the schools, which you'll hear about a little bit later on. Um, it can make a big difference in people's everyday lives. So if you're passionate about municipal government, um, you know, after this, definitely happy to connect with anybody anytime. Um, and I would also just say that if you're thinking about running at the state level, then this it's also good to start now because those are much bigger campaigns. So even though those are on the even number years, um, if you're thinking about a statewide office, it's a good idea to start early, <laughs> like Rich said. Um, so I'm going to just touch really as briefly as I can about the role of town council in Braintree, and then Councillor Flaherty will take you through sort of the nuts and bolts of running a town council campaign. Because um, I don't think everybody knows all, I certainly didn't before I started, um, exactly how the town council works here in Braintree. We have a very strong mayor format of government, which is not uncommon throughout the Commonwealth. Um, and really the three primary in writing responsibilities of the town council are to approve the budget, to approve the mayor's appointments to the boards and commissions, all of which are appointed in Braintree, 
and then to establish, amend, or approve our town ordinances. Um, and then if we break each of those down, again, as succinctly as I can, um, some things that are good to know, like our budget. That's one of the most important, in my opinion, jobs of the council because that's what funds the town. But the council does not have the power or ability to approve uh, to increase any item in the budget. We can decrease it, um, but that's really it. We can't move money around and we can't say we think more money should go to this and less money should go to that. And then for appointments to the boards and commissions, again, um, we can perhaps offer up some suggestions to the mayor, but we are not part of the um, process of vetting out candidates um, or seeing resumes or, or interviewing board and commission members. Again, we are presented um, and can approve those appointments. And then of course, last is probably um, one of, again, one of the most important things in town is you can write an ordinance, uh, we can approve ordinances and we can amend them. And ordinance is basically the rules and laws for our town. I mean, some of them are small in, in some ways. We, we allow na National Grid to open the streets for gas main work. Um, but then others can be really big and impactful and create lasting change. So while the mayor is a strong administrator in Braintree, I would argue um, and, and definitely speak to other counselors as well that your real nuts and bolts day in and day out work um, is to be a liaison between the residents and the town government. Um, and this can be so satisfying to respond to constituents, advocate for them, and, and help them navigate and bring their voice to town hall. Um, and that's really what I see as one of my primary roles as a counselor is to, to be that voice for the residents in your district, or if you're a citywide, a townwide counselor um, for, the entire, for the entire town. And, and there's nothing really more important than that because that's what you're doing at the end of the day. You are representing the residents of your district. Um, and the best way you can do that is by listening to them, advocating for them, and making sure their points of view are brought forward, um, brought forward to the council. And then I think just, uh, you know, if you haven't, if you don't know already, the town council generally meets twice a month, the first and third Tuesdays. Um, that's our full council meeting, and we do have committee meetings in between. If you're interested in town council, I would urge you to attend our council and committee meetings and, and hear the process, see what it's all about, get a feel for some of the issues that are coming before the council. And of course, um, you can get my contact information through Kathy. I'd be happy to talk to anybody who's um, thinking about running at, in town or, or at the state level too. So I will um, hand it over to Julia. Thank you, Meredith. Thanks, Meredith. Um, so my name is Julia Flaherty and I am the Braintree Town Counselor for District 1. And um, the first thing that I wanna just start with is that you know every single one of you should think about running. And it's not because I disagree with Rich about it being a big commitment because he's not wrong about that. It is a very big commitment, but you have opinions and you have skills. And if you didn't care, you wouldn't be here. So a lot of you have already run. Some of you are in positions, some of you have appointed positions, um, but some of you have never thought about running and, um, and you really, really should because at the end of the day, that's what our democracy depends on. Like if people don't run, then you get stagnants and that's not good for anybody. So um, it is a, I do encourage you to give yourself, you know, a serious, you know, think about what you might be suited for and, um, and to challenge yourself to do it. Um, but uh, to that end, like what I'm going to, what I want to talk to you about today is, you know, if you do want to run, how do you do that? How do we do this in Braintree? Um, the first thing I'll say is not everybody does it the same way, but the first thing that you can do is just learn from experience. Talk to people who have run for office before because they'll tell you what their experience was. And generally people like to be asked. They just like, people like to talk to th about themselves. So you can ask them and they'll tell you all about it, probably more than you want to know. Um, and, you know, if you, if you want, you can consider, you know, looking for, um, 
classes or um, uh, so so emerge if you're a woman emerge runs a really good program that's um, very very comprehensive and you will learn an enormous amount from emerge it's a very big time commitment and it's also kind of expensive um, the other alternatives are like the mass dems um, since you're all gems have the mass dems runs a boot camp sometimes it's more like a weekend experience they haven't set dates for that yet but you can be on the lookout for those kinds of opportunities and people will share with you um, a lot of good ideas for how this can be done. Um, and the next thing that you have to do is you have to get your people together. Um, Rich has already talked a lot about appointing a campaign treasurer and a campaign manager. Um, so those, those things I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, um, but you also need to be you just need to be calling people and talking to people and making lists of the people that you know who will show up for you in some way, um, whether it's for standouts, because um, uh, you don't even have to live in Braintree to be in a standout. Anybody can hold a sign and anybody for that matter can donate money. Um, so you can talk about talk to people in Braintree and you can talk to people from outside of Braintree. But there's also, you know, people that might be willing to canvas for you or write postcards for you. Um, you know, you need to have a sense of like who might be willing to do that and uh, talk to them about it because you'll find that people are pretty grateful uh, for anybody who's willing to run. You know, they may not, they, they, they may, ultimately they have to make a decision about who they're going to vote for and they'll do that. But they're just generally very polite and grateful to a person who's willing to put themselves out there and be a candidate for office. Um, the next thing you have to do is you have to tackle the problem of financing your campaign. A lot of it is not free. Your time may not cost you anything, um, although it's precious in a different way, but you still need money. Um, you need to make sure that you understand the rules of campaign finance law because your treasurer sh certainly should understand that, but you need to understand that as well. They're not really complicated. Like if I can learn them, you can learn them too. Um, but, and the, and uh, the OCPS website is very, very good. And they offer free trainings. I just took one today because I was like, oh, I think I need a refresher. Um, they're, they're very helpful. And uh, then once you have some idea of the rules, you establish a bank account which is a simple thing. You just go to a local institution with your treasurer and you get a bank account and um, you make sure that your treasurer also has access to it. Uh, you can, people, when people give you money, they are going to give it to you by check or credit card. And it's pretty easy to manage a check. You hand that to your treasurer and the treasurer manages it. Credit cards, generally you need some kind of online software. The one that many people use is Act Blue which takes a, a small cut of what, it, of what you um, are given, but then they organize your data for you and provide records um, in a very reliable way. And they tell you how you're doing and provide you with updates. And generally I learned to like my emails from ActBlue. Um, and, uh, and then, and this is the hard part. This is really, I think you have to call people and you have to ask them for money. And, it's not fun to like call your friend up and be like, hi, it's nice to see you, you know, how are you? Oh, are you running for office? Oh, that's wonderful. And yes, I am. And actually I'm calling you because I really, I have to be able to fund this endeavor and I'm hoping that you would be willing to give me some money. That is not something that we're generally accustomed to doing, but you have to call pretty much everyone you know. Aunt Agatha, you have to call her. Your friend from college, you have to call them. Your brother, you need to call them. Your neighbor, if you're, you know, obviously strangers are probably not going to give you any money. It's the people who know you, especially if this is your first go round. Um, so you, you have, it's hard to do. But then again, if you can't even raise money, how are you going to get any votes in the first place? Like people have to be willing to support you enough to hand you a few dollars. It doesn't have to be a lot, but, um, you, but they have, you have to be really able to convince people that you're worth a little money. <clears throat> um, in generally outside the concerns, uh, COVID concerns, people would also host an event. Um, and I don't really know where we're gonna be in the summer. I don't know what this is going to take the shape of. Typically it would be like, conventionally it would be in a restaurant in some venue and you'd pass around hors d'oeuvres and everybody who came would give a little money and you'd answer questions and, and it would be a nice time for everybody. Um, and hopefully you'd raise some money. Indoor stuff, I don't know. I don't know where we're going to be with that, but 
I think you, you're going to have to be creative about it. Think about using Zoom, which, by the way, is not free. So if you want a Zoom account, you'll have to pay for that. That's one of the reasons why you fundraise. Um, but you do have to give a lot of thought and time. And it's a little bit humbling to go out and ask for money. But you need it. You need it to do, to do this job, so to speak. Even just because running is a job, even if you lose. Um, you have to develop your message. This requires a lot of time and attention to who you are, bouncing ideas off people, what you think is going to be received well in your community. Um, why are you running? I mean, you should have an answer for that because people will literally ask you, oh, why are you running? And you have to have an answer that's better than like, um, uh, let's see. Well, I've lived here for, I'm from Braintree. I've lived in Braintree my whole life and that's why I'm running. Like that is not a good answer. You have to work harder than that. So um, you have to think about why you're running and what do you promise? Um, and what is your vision for whatever it is that you're running for? You know, what is your vision for your community, for the post that you uh, want to occupy? And, and why are you the right person for the job? Um, those those are, are things that you need to have thought through because the next thing you have to do is you have to establish a media platform. Um, now this can be a big elaborate thing or it can be a small little thing, but you need to have something. Um, and not everybody has the same thing, but one easy thing to do is to establish a campaign email address. You do not want emails that come to you to get lost among the other emails that you get from everybody in the world in your personal account. You really, having a separate email address is an easy thing to do and a thing that you can do and you should. Then you have to have some certain graphics. You need to have a good picture of yourself. You can pay to have somebody take a good headshot of you or if you have a friend who is willing to like work with you until you get something. Um, the, but you have to have some good photos of yourself, perhaps a photo of yourself with your family. Um, and then you need a campaign logo. You know, it's just your name, but maybe it has some stars or a stripe or a swish or whatever. Um, you can look at a million and one um, examples, but you need a campaign logo. And the reason you need these photos and this logo is because then you have to put it online somehow. And there's a lot of different things that you can do. You can do some of them or you can do all of them. But a lot of people establish websites. And uh, you can, it's not that hard to do. I am not a technology genius, but I have one. You can use these services called, like one is called Wix. One is called Squarespace. One is called Weebly. There's a ton of others. There's a ton of others. Um, and they all have strengths and, and I guess comparatively, you know, the strengths and weaknesses that you could compare. But um, I think any of them really will work for you at the end of the day. And uh, you build your website and that's what, and you have to supply the pictures for that, right? And you have to know what you want to say, why you're running and what you promise and what your vision is and why you're the right person for the job. That's the content that you post on those, uh, in those places, um, so you develop a website and then probably need some social media accounts. Social media is a beast. Like it can take up way too much of your time, um, but it can also be a huge advantage because it's free and anything that's free is great if you're a candidate. Um, I mostly do Facebook, but um, there's Twitter, there's Instagram. You need to not use your personal account for these things. You need to establish a campaign page or um, feed or whatever it is. So um, that's a, a task to do and another reason why you have to have these pictures and the logo that you've already developed. Um, you may consider an email platform, something like MailChimp or Constant Contact. These are um, organizations that allow you to have a, they call it an audience, which is really just an email list. And then they help you craft an email that looks nicer than what you can produce in Google. Um, and uh, usually, well, I use MailChimp and they're free as long as you're willing to put the MailChimp logo at the bottom and you don't have more than a thousand people or something. Um, so those things are all like, those are your ducks to get in a row like now and have them in place so that when the really big job comes out, which is to go out and meet people after you announce and pull papers and start getting your signatures and all that stuff, you do this, all this stuff now so that you're ready when that time comes. <clears throat> Once you're done with the media stuff, whatever it is you decide you want to commit to doing. And let me tell you, it's, it's, 
it's not that hard to do any of this. I know it's a long like list, but you just sit down and you're like, how does Squarespace work? And then you sit down and you're like, ah, oh, I need help. And then you call them and they help you. So it can be done. If I can do it, you can do it. You totally can do it. Um, okay, you're getting closer to the really big part of your job. Uh, the last thing you need to do is you have to design something called a palm card, right? This is what you're gonna hand around when you meet people in person. Um, it has to have your photo on it. It needs to have your logo on it. It's important for it to have the election date. It needs to have your contact information. How they, can they email you with your special campaign email address that you've already established? And um, you need to have the election date and your key takeaways, whatever it is that you've decided that you represent. This is related to you know, the message that you are sticking to about why, why you're running, what you promise, what your vision is, and why you're the right person for the job. You just bullet point them down real quick because people are not gonna sit down and read an article but you wanna leave them something um, after you've met them so that they have something around their house to look at and remind them that you're a person of interest. Um, and then in 2019, the next step was knock on doors. And I, I don't know what to say about this year. I, I mean, you can knock on a door and I probably will do that, but you're probably gonna to have to wear a mask and um, you may or may not feel 100% safe with that. And if you don't, then maybe you don't knock on doors. But I'm telling you that the people need to know who you are. They need to know, um, they need to, to just feel like that, they, that, that, you're, that they've been introduced. And an advertisement on the back of the Braintree Advertiser is no substitute for an opportunity just to meet them, even if you can't like shake their hand. So, I really think you need to look for ways to have face-to-face -face contact. Um, and uh, when you do that, and Rich spoke to you about this a little bit, you have to know who to contact. And the reason that you need to know that is because, look, if you're in elected office, then everybody matters If you're once you're elected. But when you're campaigning, the only people who matter are the ones who vote. And it's an astonishing number of people don't vote. In 2019, when we had a really robust slate of people running for town council and it was a mayoral race too, Braintree turned out 37.2%. Sorry. Um, Braintree turned out 37.2% of its of voters showed up and, and cast a ballot. Those are the people who chose our, our current you know, set of, of people in office. Um, and then if you go back to 2017, when we, we weren't having a mayoral race and the town council was largely unopposed, we only had 14.2% of people show up. Going into um, 2021, I don't, it's not gonna be a mayoral race, but I think we may have a more robust uh, set of challenges ahead of us um, in, in different, in, in, in other positions. So um, I would guess it's gonna be somewhere between 14.2 or 37 and 37.2. But that means that if you just go down a street and knock on every door in the street, you will be wasting a huge amount of time talking to people who are not gonna make it to the polls to vote. So how do you figure out who's, who is going to vote and who's not going to? Um, you need a list of, of addresses. You can get that from town hall. The person to talk to there is Jim Casey. Actually, Jim is a good person to talk to anyway because he'll tell you he's just, He's very supportive. He's always glad when he gets somebody in the office who says they're going to run. He'll tell you exactly what you need to do to be able to submit those signatures. He'll give you some tips on how to meet people. He will tell you information about OCPF. He's the guy you're going to submit your uh, fundraising campaign finance information to. Like Jim Casey is good at what he does. He's very knowledgeable. He's very supportive. You should feel comfortable talking to him um, and listen to him because he's... Um, he is experienced. Uh, so <clears throat> once you have a list of targeted addresses, who to contact, then <clears throat> you go and if you're knocking on doors, you leave that palm card that you developed that has your photo and it has the date of the election and it says how to contact you and it, and it has the bulleted points about what the things that are important to you. Um, you leave a, a palm card at each address, even if they don't answer the door. 
And by the end of the campaign, I wrote little notes like, sorry, I missed you. Maybe I'll, you know, hopefully I'll run into you another time. Um, and you leave a palm card in each address, but not in the mailbox. You can't touch the mailbox. It's illegal. You just have to slide it in. It fits into the window or door most of the time. Or if you get one of those door hangers that fits on a doorknob, that can be a good thing too. So, um, but you leave that palm card there because um, they need to know that you came by, that you cared enough to knock on their door and try to meet them. Um, and then you have to understand it's a marathon. It is a marathon. It is not a sprint. Um, you're not going to do this in a couple of weeks, the last, you know, 10 days before the election, because there's too many people, even if you're just running in one district um, and you're not considering a townwide campaign, it is, um, you do have to sort of just physically prepare yourself to be on your feet a lot, moving through the neighborhood, introducing yourself to people the best that you can. As you do that, um, be informed. That's why, you know, you're going to do what Meredith Berica said is go to meetings, understand what the town um, is, is thinking about now as the main issues. And then be honest, because you really, you're not going to get their roads paved if DPW doesn't want to pave their roads. Like, so don't tell them that you're going to. Don't tell them that you can get their sidewalks fixed, because that's not really, unless you're the mayor and you can tell the, the DPW to do that, that's just not in your purview. So be honest with them about what you can do for them. Um, be informed. If you can tell them something that they didn't already know, then you've already been helpful to them and they will remember that. Um, let's, I'll, I'll mention a little bit about signs. Uh, oh my God, I'm talking too long. I'm talking much too long. I'm almost done. I'm so sorry. Um, signs. Signs are what you, you put your logo on a sign and then a pe people will volunteer to put them in their yard or you'll have them at a standout and people will hold them at a street corner. So you're probably gonna need signs. Occasionally you get a candidate who decides, especially if they're really entrenched, that they don't aren't gonna have a sign. Like <clears throat> I know Shannon Hume made an announcement. She wasn't gonna do signs. Shannon Hume got elected again, so she didn't need signs. But the, and the truth is the signs don't persuade voters. Like there's not any research that says, oh, well, the person who had the most signs is the one that's gonna win. Actually, that's not true at all because signs don't vote. Um, but what signs can do for you is, is um, offer some name recognition so that when you do come around to their house and meet them, they'll be like, oh, I've seen your signs. And it, it provides a nice segue into whatever. The last couple of things, you have to plan standouts um, to think about hosting coffee hours on Zoom. Coffee hours are just a way for candidate uh, residents to come and meet you and ask you questions and represent what they want. They are, um, not necessarily well attended, but in that case, you just work on something else. Um, and if somebody shows up, that's great for you. But people want to know that they could approach you if they wanted to. And so you do that. All right, I'm, I'm sorry, I, did, I was timing myself and then I was not paying attention to my timer. So I apologize, I pogged the time, but I'm done now. Very much uh, to both town councilors. Um, before we go on to school community, does anyone have any questions for Rich, Meredith, or Julia? If you could just raise your hand, uh, Robert will recognize you. So. Good, Anne Leland. All right. Well, you guys were both great. You both were great. Julia, you're very funny. <laughs> um, but I do have a couple questions. I'll ask you uh, each a question and then you can, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you, I'll direct a question to each of you and then you can decide which of you wanna answer it. So um, uh, Meredith, you made a point earlier about um, how candidates were vetted for boards. And uh, I mean that they are appointed by the mayor, um, but, but you said one of the things the council does not do is you don't have the opportunity. You're not part of the council's not part of the vetting process. Um, is there a one sentence answer as to you as to know, like if someone were interested in being on a board or commission or something, how, how are the candidates vetted? 
So I think my recommendation is if you're interested in sitting on one of Braintree's boards or commissions, um, I would say first uh, attend the meetings. They're usually monthly depending on the board or commission. Yep. And ask yourself, um, what do you have interest and expertise on, expertise in? Um, because mm -hmm. our boards do have professionals. We need them. We need professionals on the conservation commission and the planning board. Um, right. And then the other thing you want to make sure is you can go on to the town website, braintreema.gov, mm -hmm. and you can see if there are openings on any of the boards or commissions, uh, because they do have a set number of seats or they have a maximum number of seats. So you'd want to first find out, you know, if there's openings on boards or commissions, and then you can also go online and there's a talent bank form that you need to complete. And I, um, I'm the council appointee to the partnership on brain tree substance use prevention, which I'm honored and flattered to be part of, but I had to come, complete a talent bank form for that. And that's an appointment as well. So um, those are sort of, I would say those are the three things that you should do if you're interested in a board or commission and then reach out to the current board members and ask them, you know, what, how they got on the board, how they were appointed. Um, their emails are typically not on the town website, but you can reach out to the director of the department. So for example, the conservation commission, um, is underneath the planning department, um, as is the planning board. And, and anybody in the planning department will be able to help you um, navigate that system. But everybody has to fill out uh, one of the talent bank forms as well. And then you know that can be held onto and refreshed um, if an opening appears. OK, thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. And then the, the other one, um, Julia, that I wanted to ask you about, you were speaking a little bit about the cost of, you know, the, the, the money, raising money, raising uh, funds for, for running. Um, either of you can answer this, obviously, but just as a sort of ballpark, if, if somebody were going to run for any townwide office, well, well, just let's just say as a, is it sort of a base budget, baseline budget, minimum amount that you'd want to have. And then, you know, it'd be a minimum amount might be X and a townwide amount or a nice to have amount might be why. So, you know, you know, maybe the, I have no idea, I'm making up numbers here, but I mean, you know, maybe the, the minimum might be five or 7,000 and the nice to have would be 10 or, I really have no idea. I was just wondering if either of you had input into that. Uh, well, if you want to know specifically what any candidate in Braintree has spent or raised, that is available to you on the town website because it's legally required for it to be available to you. Yep. Um, I can tell you that a district campaign is gonna run a couple of thousand and if it's fiercely contested, it can run much more than that. Um, and I, I actually reviewed it today because I, like I said, I took this OCPF training and um, made me curious to go back and look at you know, where various people were. And um, they, you, I mean, everything, you, it costs money to have a website. It costs money to do printings. It costs money for stamps. It costs money to host a website. I mean, uh, host an event. It costs money to um, have a Zoom thing. It costs money to uh, get a headshot if you pay somebody to do it. Like, um, it, there's just a lot of, a lot of expenses to, especially a mailing. That's postage is actually one of the biggest expenses, to be honest with you. But printing is a big deal. And yep. anyway. That's, yeah. that's the answer I, the best answer I can give you. You should look. You can, yeah, you, you said you don't know what people spend. The district wide was around two or three, you said, I think, and then I forget what, upwards of that, right? It can go, yeah. I think you can go up to like 10,000. Sure. Okay. And, yeah, and that well, is on the website, and So I just for the sake of time, I, yes. I would like to move on. Yeah. Uh, Robert, do you have a question? Yeah, it was just a quick one. This is for um, Rich. So did you guys knock on doors? I know you were in the campaign during COVID. And if not, what was your, where did you shift your priorities to? Because I know uh, we knock on is important. Right. Yeah, great question. Um, we, well, we were kind of three weeks in, so we had started knocking. Um, <laughs> but what we end up doing is we moved more to uh, phone banking and um, actually we decided that we spent more money on dear friend cards 
Um, and I, I, I don't think we brought up the upfront cards actually um, in this presentation, but um, the upfront cards are great because it's, you know, from someone that people trust. So if you can get as many people to get sent out as many people uh, cards to people that they know, you know, a lot of times that helps. And that's what we had to go to it because, you know, door knocking was completely out. Um, we also, at the end, we, uh, the, the issue we had with COVID, and it goes back to me saying start early, we started late. So we were late in the election process when my candidate decided to run, uh, not extremely late, but late. Um, and then COVID hit like immediately. You know, we did some of the caucuses to meet people and then COVID hit. So um, fundraising was what our, our worst nightmare was with COVID because um, you couldn't really have fundraisers. Uh, you were trying to call people and Julia made a great point. Uh, Four hours ago, like don't forget should, to stop and pick it up. You should um, definitely know that you should be setting aside and hitting up that circle of friends that can get you money. Um, what happened with my candidate was that her job because of COVID decided went crazy and we didn't, she wasn't able to spend a lot of time looking for that fundraising. So at, when we finally got some money, we also did door hangers. Um, so we didn't knock on doors. We just went up to people that were good voters and put a door hanger on their door. So it's not as good as meeting them, but we at least knew that they got some literature from us. I, I would like to add that if you are a Democrat, uh, each Democratic town committee has access to Vote Builder, which will give you information about the good voters in your in your town and uh, whether they generally wrote, vote for Democrats. So it, it'll tell you how they voted in in the primaries, because of course you don't. You can't say how somebody voted in a general election, but it will tell you whether they pulled the Democratic or Republican ballot in the primaries. So if you're a Democrat, uh, you can uh, appeal to your Democratic town committee for help with uh, data um, uh, by getting permission um, to uh, use their vote builder account. So, um, Kathy, um, we, I was running a county campaign, so we actually bought Vote Builder. Um, and uh, the Democratic Party has an interesting method of figuring out how much money you'll pay for that, but we won't get into that. Um, but you can also, what it also does is it gives you not just a Democratic, but what you, as Ju um, Julia said, you want to look at, you know, numerous, you know, at least probably three back um, you know, elections so that you get good voters and you want to make a decision on what a good voter means to you. Um, but, you know, there are going to be some people that voted in the last campaign because we had 37 percent, but may have not have voted in the last few. So um, or the two before that. So you, you want to look at what you you have to make some decisions on what people you're going after because you are going to have limited time. Um, and, you know, and if you have money to mail, then you can go after a different group of people versus whether you're going to have to hit every door. I don't know if any the candidates have a comment on that, but. We're going to go on to school committee now. Uh, so, so we can have the other uh, candidates have a chance to speak. And our school committee representative is Kelly Cobb Lemire. Um, Kelly, do you want me to share the screen or? Um... Yeah, that would be great, Kathy. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Kathy, and the members for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Rich, Julia, and Meredith for, for participating as well. Um, I won't um, reiterate some of the things that you folks said. I'll just kind of focus on the school committee the roles and responsibilities. So um, as Rich said, this is a school committee is a four year term. In Braintree, we have six members um, plus the mayor. So there's seven members, um, three 
members are elected alternate years and three the other. Um, the chair is voted by the school committee. Uh, the chair appoints members to subcommittees and the, the role of the chair is to run the school committee meetings. However, no member has any more voting power than any other and all the discussions and deliberations must be done in public with all members present, present or at least a quorum. So the role of the school committee, as you may guess, is to basically advocate for all students. Um, we ensure accountability to taxpayers and we are responsible to promote public education and provide support and set direction. So um, that's the role, the responsibilities uh, of the school committee is to work very closely with a superintendent. Um, the school committee also um, hires, evaluates, uh, can terminate, and um, the superintendent. So the superintendent is somebody that we work very closely with, and we support the superintendent in matters that conform to committee policy. Uh, all the board members work together um, as a governance team, um, and the superintendent you know, makes decisions that will best serve the students, and we support and develop promotion of the vision, mission, goals, and strategies of this school system. Um, if you go on to the next screen, pretty much these are the responsibilities and, and pretty much the key responsibilities are the first four, policy, finance, staffing, and collective bargaining. So in policy, um, that's probably the most important thing for school committee. We establish and periodically review educational goals and policy for the schools and the district and make sure they consist, they're consistent with the requirements of law and the statewide goals, which includes DESE and um, all the standards established by the Board of Education. In finance, um, what we do there is we review and approve and oversee the annual budget, school budget for the district. With staffing, um, as I mentioned, we hire, appoint, evaluate, and if necessary, terminate the superintendent. We set salary and negotiate the superintendent's employment contract. We also appoint the assistant superintendent, school business administrators, and administrator of special ed, any school physicians and nurses, as well as the legal counsel. Um, we're directly responsible for those hires. We don't, we're not responsible for the teachers or anything like that. Um, but, we, um, but we do, um, in collective bargaining, we act as the employer of the school and for collective bargaining purposes. So when, when we review contracts for teachers, the buses and um, the cafeteria workers, we would negotiate their contracts with them on an annual basis. So those are really the four most important things that we do. Um, other things that we also do is uh, performance standards, which you know we make sure that we work with the superintendent to make sure the teachers are getting the professional development that they need um, and, and so forth. But we work with the superintendent. And um, the next thing that we work on is professional development and that, is also through um, the Mass Association of School Committees. That organization provides programs, services, and um, professional development. And they also provide resources, guidance, expertise to our members. So they're a very important um, organization um, that we do continuing education and workshops with them periodically throughout the year. Um, another um, organization that I work with is uh, Mass Alliance which is a political and advocacy organization, and they help support progressive candidates, not only to get elected, but they support you once you're actually in office to help you um, meet other people and to build um, relationships and help you to put forth uh, progressive policies. Uh, another organization is the Mass um, Women's Political Caucus. They help um, get people elected and they also endorse candidates. So that's another organization um, that you might think about. Um, as far as school councils, we, we basically 
um, each school has a, a, a school council and those school councils report to the school committee yeah. and give ideas for school improvement plans um, for every school in the district. Um, as far as uh, the next uh, bullet point here is I have is advocacy. Um, and that's important because we try to engage um, in advocacy on behalf of all the students in each of their schools and to benefit public schools to the community and whole. Um, we work closely with governmental agencies and bodies, including our state senators and state representative, um, as well as um, DESE and other organizations. We also try to collaborate with other school committees throughout the state and try to share information with them and uh, find out other local concerns and issues that they may be having and that we can get information and guidance from them. Uh, the next um, the next bullet point is curriculum. Um, while the school committee doesn't really, um, you know, we don't pick the curriculum, but we do help the superintendent adopt different curriculums, including textbooks and so forth. And um, also, you know, he helping with different um, history. That's one of the things that we were working on right now is is revising and updating our history curriculum, which I think is very important and in including, including civics as, um, as a course. So um, another bullet point here is the governess, which again, I said, I'll touch on briefly that um, this, the, the school committee established educational goals and policies for the district uh, based on requirements. And then um, we also delegate the superintendent to be responsible for all administrative functions. That's another thing that we do. Um, and lastly is communication. So that's probably when I'm not in an actual school committee meeting, probably most of my time, especially with COVID has been taken up with communicating with my constituents and um, you know, communicating with them back and forth and answering their concerns about reopening and different things. And main, it's important, one thing I have to say, it's important to maintain open communication with the community and with the schools. And that's what we do at public meetings, but also it's important to do it, um, you know, in your emails and make sure that you're responding to any concerns that the, that the taxpayers may have. And that if you can't answer it, it's important to forward it to somebody in administration that can. So, um, you know, those are probably the key responsibilities for the school committee. Um, of course, you know, <laughs> um, I, I suggest that anybody that's interested in running for school committee, I highly recommend that they attend school committee meetings. And now that everything's on Zoom, I think it's really, um, a lot of people are paying attention to what's going on in the school committee. Um, I know that I was somebody that went to school committee meetings for many, many years. And the, most of the time I was the only person in, in attendance besides uh, school committee members. So now the good news is with, with uh, COVID, the good thing is people are actually paying more attention. They're attending meetings and they're, um, they're more active. So I think that's the good side uh, of, of COVID because of course the pandemic has really put a strength tremendous amount of strain on everyone. Um, you know, working families, our youngest students, uh, kids that need special needs, and of course, um, you know, our teachers. So I think we're all trying to do the best that we can, but of course it's, you know, unprecedented times. So it's clearly um, not, not the easiest time to try to learn the ropes of school committee in the middle of a pandemic. But um, I, I think, you know, we're gonna do better and I encourage people to, um, to run because I think it's really important. I mean, I was a co-chair of my PTO. Um, I was, you know, part of the uh, full day kindergarten committee. Um, I'm on um, the middle school transition team and I'm also on student council. So it seemed a natural progression for me to go to school committee. So when Rich and, the, and Julia and Meredith were talking about what your interests are, it kind of makes sense to, you know, if you've been involved in the schools in those kind of organizations, it makes sense um, to get involved in the school committee. And I encourage people to do that. And if anybody has any questions or wants, um, you know, more information, I'm happy to talk to them. I also have a school committee page. So um, I thank everybody and I'm happy to take any questions um, if anybody has any. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you.
So um, I, I would be just because of time constraints, I would like to go on to uh, the other two people who are here that are town officials and then reserve my questions for the end. So <clears throat> uh, the ne our next uh, town official is Laura Kalpas, who is uh, a, on the library board of trustees. Uh, you can see that there are four positions open on the ballot. So I'm gonna stop my share. So um, screen share and Laura, uh, uh, can you talk a little bit about your role as a trustee at the library? Yes, and thank you, Kathy, for asking me and thank you for everyone being here. Unlike the other town elected offices, the library trustee position does not really require any campaigning or committee or treasurer. In fact, it's often difficult to find people that will offer to run for the position. Um, it's a pretty set group. And when an opening does come up, as I say, we're usually looking around and asking each other, do you know anybody who might want to do this? Um, you, beyond getting the signatures, there's really no campaigning at all to, do, to be done. Time commitment, we meet once a month and it's about three or four hours a month if you include preparation. So it's not a huge commitment, but the library is a very important fixture in our town and provides many wonderful services for the community. As a trustee, we are charged with oversight of the building and the hiring of the director. The director does do all of the day-to-day -day running of the library. She will bring us her budget considerations. We vote on budget policies, um, various issues that just affect the libraries. It's a small place to start for a town office, but it, it's a good learning experience. And it's not a big time commitment, but again, it's important to our community. And we do have a lot of things right now with COVID that have really taken a lot of time to work through how the library will operate under severe restrictions that we have. One thing that we're responsible for is promoting the library in the town. And right now we're not doing any of that because of the restrictions that we're all finding in various ways impact how we carry out our town commitments. But I'm not gonna speak for a long time about it because I know we're running short. And I do wanna say if anyone does wanna run for trustee, it would be great. It's a great learning experience. The main thing you have to do is really want to help the library and, and enjoy the aspects of what the library provides to the community. So I'm gonna wrap it up at that. <laughs> Hey, thank you so much. Uh, the library, uh, for those of us who uh, who grew up around them and are readers, uh, they are special places. But today they have an even more important role. Uh, they provide uh, technology for students that may not have Wi-Fi at home and and uh, and. And before COVID, there were lots of social groups. So library is a great uh, place. If you, if you love libraries, it's a great place to start. Um, so thank you very much, Laura. And I would like to ask Tom Reynolds, who is on the uh, electric light board to speak now. Tom, are thank you? you, Kathy. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, you know, one of the biggest things that I've learned from running for office uh, or what I've gained from running for office is the friendships that you develop over time. 
um, on the campaign trail, talking with people and, and meeting them for the first time and seeing them at almost every event during that campaign. So I, I take that as one of the biggest highlights of running for office. Uh, but as for the Municipal Light Board, um, the Municipal Light Board charge is with overseeing the strategic um, direction of the Light Board. Uh, and in 1892, town meeting voted $30,000 to build a generation plant and to do some street lighting. In, two, in 1909, uh, town meeting and in, in 1892 it was under the direction of the Board of Selectmen at the time. And in uh, 1909, town meeting um, established the Municipal Light Board. And, you know, many changes have occurred over the 129 years that the Light Board's been in business. Um, but the commitment to the community stays the same. And, you know, the, the commitment was to supply reliable, cost effective energy with excelled uh, customer service. And, and the people we answer to are the residents who are actually our, our owners. So, our customers and our owners. But in the 112 years um, since the board has been established, um, there's, been tw uh, there's been 28 elect elected uh, light commissioners. And of those 28, six have served for over 20 years. And um, Mr. Potter, uh, who was elected to the first board served for 47 years as a commissioner. Uh, and, and one of the, the, the things that makes Braintree Light unique is, and to be on, and to be, anyone could run for that seat. But what it's made it unique over the years is the different people that have run with their background. Some of them, a the majority them with an electrical background. Um, you know, so that's uh, one of the things that got me involved was that I come from a family that worked in the um, investor-owned utilities. Um, my parents, my aunts and uncles, actually my parents met while working, you know, in the utilities. So then I, you know, I worked myself in the utilities when I got out of high school uh, as an apprentice lineman. And then when the energy shortage came in the 70s, I then went on uh, back to school and took and studied marine engineering, which is actually ocean going power plant. And that's where my interest was. Um, but as Rich mentioned earlier that uh, I got involved at a young age, handing out literature door to door. And then in high school, I actually got involved in an, on a selectman's uh, in a park commissioner's race. So that's, those there were my beginnings. And there is a lot involved. I've been an elected official in Braintree this year in March, 40 years. I started as a park commissioner. I served as a selectman and, uh, and also now on the electric light. I've run for a number of different seats and have not always been successful. Most recently as mayor. Um, and then I also ran countywide for a county commissioner oh, about 25 years ago. And um, so I, I've run both uh, local and countywide. I know what's involved, um, you know, that sometimes you can't even go to the supermarket in town because you get hit from every direction about your rubbish not being picked up, your street not plowed. Um, but, you know, it, all in all, it's, it's been a great um, time running for these positions. And I will say when I first ran, um, I ran for selectmen, there was seven people that ran for the one seat. For the one seat. There was nine when I ran for um, uh, the ta uh, town clerk. So, um, you know, so there's, there's always been a number uh, back then. And as years went on, there, there was less and less involvement. And, and I don't know if it's because of uh, 
you know, the, the way that people are today, they're quick to criticize and, and, you know, some people that are on a volunteer basis are saying, why do I have to put up with this? But it's the dedicated people that continue to show up. And uh, as, as people mentioned earlier, there, there isn't sometimes a lot of people in the audience at your meetings. I mean, we've gone months uh, meetings with nobody there. And, um, you know, so it's, it does, uh, you wonder sometimes about involvement and uh, where is all, where are all these people? But, you know, it's, it's your dedication and your commitment to your community um, that there isn't a lot there today. And it, it seems to be the same people that are stepping up and, and I wish there were more getting involved, but um, you know, the, it's, it does take an, uh, uh, it does impact your family. As Rich mentioned, you're out on the road a lot, you're banging on doors and, you know, uh, I know as a selectman, I had a separate phone number. So I would spend an hour almost at night when I got home from my day job, uh, answering questions and complaints. And, uh, but it, it, it was all worthwhile. I'm, I'm proud of my accomplishments. I'm, I'm proud of my involvement and I'm proud of this town and, and what we've accomplished over the years. And it goes back to these people in the 1800s who, who started it all for us and, and, and we're following in their footsteps. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, I think the last three um, town officials really highlighted that you should pick an area that interests you, as Rich said, and go for it. Um, there, uh, you know, you do meet a lot of really, really nice people along the way and uh, you build uh, a new network actually. So it's uh, a good thing to do. So be I'm just gonna briefly talk about housing authority and then uh, I'm gonna open it up to questions. We have a lot of good questions in the chat. And uh, um, so uh, the how we were unfortunately unable to get anybody to speak from the housing authority. There are uh, four elected positions and one appointed. Uh, the term um, for the elected officials is four years and uh, the appointed uh, position is for five years. That member is appointed by uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Department of Housing and Community Development. So uh, right now the appointed member is Sandra Sisk. Um, as far as their power, the powers, um, according to the town charter, the Braintree Housing Authority shall make careful studies of the housing needs within the town and shall provide such programs to make available housing for families of low income and for elderly persons of low income as it deems to be necessary or desirable. And it also may make studies and investigation relative to community, de community development, including desirable patterns for land use and community growth. I believe that most of, the, most of the duties of the current housing authority are um, to do with the uh, senior housing in, in town and uh, perhaps the, the um, uh, affordable housing such as the 40B, but as I said, I'm not an expert here. Um, and, but again, um, these last three positions, library trustee, um, school committee, um, and electric light board, generally uh, people have been running uncontested the last few election cycles. Uh, occasionally there's an ex one extra candidate in there, but they're generally uncontested. So if the, you have an interest in it and you feel that you should, uh, you have something you can contribute, I would definitely say go for it. Um, so with that, I'm gonna open up um, um, the meeting to a question period and um, 
So, um, uh, John Cass, you had some questions in the uh, chat. Would you like to? Um, would you like to ask those questions now? Certainly. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Richard, uh, could you give examples of how folks ran lost, but their campaign influenced the winner to do some of the things the person who lost ran on? Sure. Um, the, the most recent one that I would use as an example is the register probate that we just ran. Uh, Courtney Madden from Quincy. Uh, we had had a few things that were in our uh, platform. Um, and when we talked to Colleen Briley, who ended up being the winner, um, she's incorporated that into her plan. Uh, again, it has not been done yet, but she has told us that some of those um, items that we had brought up will be utilized. And um, I, you know, this didn't happen uh, in that, in Braintree, uh, but um, I did uh, was involved in a campaign um, that the loser uh, that we were we we lost. I mean, we all lose campaigns every now and then. Um, we had brought up a lot of zoning issues. And the person that had uh, won that campaign uh, utilized those zoning and, and fixed zoning issues that we had brought up. So uh, I can't come off with, a, I mean, I can go way back into Boston politics and bring up a bunch of stuff, but um, I don't want to spend that much time. But there are, I think what happens a lot of times, too, is um, people see, they incorporate some of your ideas um, while you're running into their campaign, too. So it may not be right after, but it all of a sudden becomes their ideas. We've all seen that happen. Um, and that is a way to influence, though, because you've, you've changed the ideas that some people that are running against you have. So uh, that's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Yep. And then the other question that I had for was for Meredith and Julia. What would the DTC do to support candidates more? Uh, what do you think? would get more candidates to run and what should the DTC uh, do to put that into action? Uh, I'll, I'll field a little bit of that, Meredith, and then you can chime in because you may be thinking different things. I mean, one of the things that the, this forum right here, this is a really smart thing for the Braintree Democratic Town Committee to do because I think it's very nebulous, like what running for office really means. People don't really have a concrete idea of what that is going to entail. And, um, and, they, and that keeps them from considering it in a meaningful way. And then they also think it's too overwhelming. And I know I gave this really incredibly long, long laundry list of, of items, but each item is really achievable. Like you can set up a bank account, you can have an email account, you can call your friends and ask for money if you want to. Um, each of those discrete items is totally achievable. You just need sort of like a checklist of like the things that you need to do. And that's you know what, I, what this forum can provide. And um, what Meredith has provided is an understanding of what the town council can actually do, what our job actually is, because there's a lot of misunderstanding about what our powers really are. And I, you know, Laura Kolpus and uh, the other people who've spoken about that from the different perspective of the different boards um, have tried to give you an idea of what those um, bodies really do. Because, you know, it, it is, it makes a lot of sense to think about what your interests um, align with most and, and what your time commitment really, your available time commitment can meet. Um, so I, I think this form is really, really smart. Um, and then Rich highlighted two things. If you don't wanna run, then you can be a really big help to somebody who is. You can ask people to run. First of all, you have to ask, okay? And um, you should all be asking other people to run if you are really insistent that it cannot be you because often you have to ask somebody a lot of times. The next thing that you can do is you can agree to be their campaign treasurer Okay, agree to learn the OCPF rules, agree to handle the bank account, agree to support them in that way, or you can be the campaign manager and agree to coordinate those volunteers. And, you know, when they've had a bad day because somebody was a real jerk to them, um, you know, tell them how awesome they are because every candidate needs to hear that sometimes. They really do. It is, 
it's sometimes really exhilarating because you meet people and they're like, oh, I'm so happy to meet you. Thank you for running. It's really the spirit of democracy is um, so critical and I'm so glad you're running. And then other people are like, just looking for a way to disagree with you, right? So, and then they find it and um, that can be hard. So encouraging people to be those real big helpers, that's another thing that the Braintree Democratic Town Committee can do. And sometimes, um, you know, the vote builder has been supplied to candidates and that has been a, a good resource too. And because the town, uh, I think, the county offices that Rich was referring to, because a in a Democratic primary, uh, the Democratic Party does not endorse one candidate over the other. That's why he had to pay. Whereas in the nonpartisan elections um, uh, in Braintree, uh, it could be a different story. So, so when we've when we've used Vote Builder to help our candidates, it's because we know, even though it's a nonpartisan election, we know that the candidate is a Democrat. I'm sure the Republican uh, Town Committee has something similar, but um, we do have access to that, and it's it is a pretty powerful thing. You can you can map. Um, uh, street, you can get a uh, map for canvassing. So, you know, you're just hitting those people who are going to be good, strong Democratic voters with your um, palm cards and your um, door hangers. So uh, you can filter the, filter the list in a lot of different ways. So uh, does anyone else have any other questions or did Meredith have anything to add uh, to that? I would just add, you know, I think um, support our candidates. If you yourself are not running, um, every single one of us has a network of people in town we know, and that is a massive help to people. So, you know, you, you we can all make a commitment right now, even to say, you know, I'm going to host a, whether it's Zoom, backyard, whatever, host a meet and greet, donate money, um, and and reach out to your own networks to spread the word. Because that is in these, especially at the local level, there's nothing better than word of mouth. We're not doing TV, we're not doing radio. You know, we need we need boots on the ground um, and support networks. I think this is a real advantage of being a member of a party. We have each other um, and we have the resources of, of the Braintree Democratic Town Committee to support, foster, engage, um, not just with the candidates, but with each of our own networks to help spur conversation and, and democracy. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions, Robert? Do you see uh, hands raised? See Anne's hand. Okay, Anne? Yeah, you need to un yeah, go unmute. Yeah, unmute me. Um, I was just going to ask, and if it was already mentioned, my apologies. There's been a lot of data tonight that's <laughs> coming at us. So, um, is, does the town have any sort of, or have his, historically, has the town had any kind of um, various types of candidates nights for the different uh, boards or offices or whatever? So is it, I presume before COVID, you know, there could have been, for example, candidate forums at the library or the town hall or the whatever. Would it be, or has it, has it come up that it might be, um, possible to have candidate nights for each of the different uh, offices uh, on a Zoom type, you know, format. So I don't know either if historically if it's done here or if it could be done here. Well, we, Braintree Dems um, um, coordinated with Holbrook and Randolph Dems to um, to do Zoom forums for the county officer offices and also for uh, state senate and state rep. Um, so that was how we handled it during 
uh, COVID. I know um, Tom had when when he was running for mayor held held some forums. Tom, do you want to talk about how you set the, those up? Uh, sure. I, I, one of the things that we did was we tried to um, identify certain sections of town and we invited uh, the councilors that were running. We, we invited everyone to every one of our forums uh, and gave everyone an opportunity to speak. Some took us up on the offer, others didn't. But, uh, you know, it, it's one way, it was one way of getting everyone's voice out there. Uh, some of them, you know, maybe weren't having a fundraiser or weren't, you know, uh, having a gathering. And this was one way of introducing them and getting to network with other people in town. So that's one way of doing it. Uh, you know, years ago, League of Women Voters had a candidate night and each civic association in town would, would host a candidate's night. They would be held. Uh, the, I know the League of Women Voters normally would do it at the town hall. And then uh, the library or the uh, yacht club or a, a local um, establishment would host, you know, a candidate's night and everyone would, you know, it would be moderated by the Civic Association or, or the, the league and, you know, the questions would be asked and it was done fairly. It, it worked out good. And those have kind of gone by the wayside uh, recently in the past few years. Well, we don't have a League of an active League of Women Voters uh, in Braintree anymore, but uh, uh, Laura, were you part of the group uh, from the library, the former League of Women voters who put together the uh, mayoral forums last time around? Well, I think what happened is some, some of people who formerly were part of the League of Women Voters ran something. Of course, COVID has put a, a, a we, can't, we can't really do uh, those types of forums in the age of COVID. And, uh, but um, I think our, our Zoom meetings were, uh, were good because they uh, are easy for people to attend. And we also, um, we also posted the video recording online. So people who weren't able to attend could review uh, what the candidates said. I believe the Chamber of Commerce in, in, in uh, Braintree also has, did a Zoom with uh, various candidates. Kathy, I, I would add, I partnered with two former league members and we arranged the candidates nights. I believe there were two or three of them, but we asked John Dennehy to be our moderator and there was an awful lot of work involved doing it. It was very worthwhile. I don't know without a mayoral race, what kind of response we would yet unfortunately and it's probably something we discussed doing again but I, I'm just not certain we talked about trying to find out if we could reestablish the League of Women Voters it's a complicated procedure and one of the problems was people just didn't volunteer to, to belong or do any of the work and that's why the former League just it just went away. There was no one left to pick up the pieces and, and run with it. Most unfortunate. Yes, because they provided a good service and, and they had a, a very fair format for, for a, asking uh, questions because they are a nonpartisan group. Well, if anyone is interested in maybe looking into reestablishing it, it is a possibility, but we do have to have commitments from people who are going to be willing to, to work at it. Thank you. Are there any other questions before we adjourn with, with this, with this meeting's uh, 
uh, a little longer than I, I, I was hoping that we could stick to about an hour and a half. Uh, so uh, I'll, if there's one last question, does anybody have a question? Okay, so uh, I would thank everybody who came to the meeting and um, thank you very much to the town officials who, who gave up their time to speak to us tonight. Um, we are very fortunate to have you um, representing us. Uh, I would add that uh, Ju both Julia and Meredith have, ha and Kelly uh, have done an outstanding job of communicating with constituents. Um, Tom and Laura have a have really a, a special, um, a, more of a specialty uh, uh, interest and uh, and provide a great service to the town. So I thank you very much. Um, I just like to mention that on February 23rd, uh, Brinja Dems is co-sponsoring a healthcare forum uh, with Dr. Al Alan Matthews, Representative Lindsay Sabadosa and Senator Ed Markey. Um, that's being co-sponsored by various democratic town committees around the state. And I will post a link that on our website and uh, um, also on our Facebook page. And then our last meeting is, our next meeting will be on March 10th. So um, with that, I would like to thank everybody once again and uh, adjourn the meeting. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion. Okay, second. 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 Favor? Aye. 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 Thank Great you. meeting. Thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate your being here. <laughs>